put this stuff in action because a lot of times we talk strategically uh, and don't do a lot of, of you know, boots on the ground stuff. So um, we did that this time. We're doing we did three proof of concepts. So the first one involves the fuel sample uh, data set, which is from the National Fuel Moisture Database and the standalone database um, in, in access originally. And we wanted to work with Travis, Travis Bird again. And the goal is to make that data useful um, and to provide it to business so they can start making decisions. So what we did is we brought that, um, that data in. Uh, we have we mapped all the sites. Uh, we have um, certain metrics that might will go into the percentage of the percent moisture at the current sites, um, fuel moisture over time, uh, like fuel moisture at that point, how like the current moisture uh, looks over the average of the ten, last 10 years. Um, so different metrics so that were important to the fire weather, or to the fire environment folks. So we'll go into detail on that. Uh, also, this, uh, so the second proof of concept involved getting reference data out of the enterprise data governance tool or the edge tool so that um, we can integrate it with the rest of the community. So that's what the incident switching codes and titles, NWC organization, and the Scott and Bergen fuel models. Those three um, are showing that we can take data out of the edge so that people can use reference data. Um, in their own applications, and we have one source of truth for those things, like organizations um, or you know, whatever it is. We have one list, one pick list, interagency is using those same list. And then the third one inv involves um, fire occurrence, so that's that fire occurrence data mark. Uh, and then this one we're looking at, at this is where we saw that time domain. So we have um, informed historical fire data. Uh, we took the data out of the NIFSI board from behind the NIFSI board uh, using a token. So we're getting real time data. And um, we didn't have a way to look at local time. So we have epoch time, we had UTC, we had the offset, but there was no way to say, okay, show me all the fires over, you know, the 300,000 fires we have. What was the local time of the incident of the um, point of order? We weren't able to do that. So now we've created time domain. So now you, you can look at fires over time. When do they, um, you know, when's the window that we, they normally ignite? Like we probably all, all know the afternoon is the hottest, it gets windy, and that's the, the witching hour they ignite. But you would really know. So now we're able to see when fires, um, when, they, when they've occurred, and also like the number of acres, the um, Number of fires and just do like the analytics that the business wants um, from that transmission data set. So, Carlos is going to give you an overview. Of, we're going to talk about that conceptual data architecture that we talked about in the spring, just so everyone knows what we're doing with the IDME. And then we'll talk about the physical data architecture. So, like, how, what does it look like? We're going to use in, a, in the cloud, what, is, um, what are the tools that we're going to use to make this happen? And then Mike's going to go into the details um, on the different data sets, the pipelines, the dimensional model, for the time that I was talking about. Um, and we'll go from there to the of discussion. We're going to talk about fuel moisture, reference data, and fire crimes. All right, Carlos, you want to? I'll just drive from there. And oh, OK. And that's from the I'm kind of out of the way here. So uh, I probably won't go into the conceptual architecture in as much detail as we did uh, in April, if you were here in April. Uh, uh, but I will cover it a little bit just to give everybody an overview and an idea of why we conceptualize this and what we're trying to solve and why we build it. And so, am I too close to the camera? It's great. Yeah. How about the bathroom? Because I'm bouncing. We don't want to fall asleep. And so, you know, 
we're all here, right? We want to use data. We want to use data better. There's a lot of problems these days. We we have access to a lot more data, and yet it's it's become much more difficult in some ways to get value out of our data. The architectures that give you data the way you want, the way you need the data, when you want it, how you want it, right? That would be ideal, so you wouldn't have to worry about figuring it out, trying to figure out how to get it, where to get it. You you get it, and it's available to you how you need it, right? So now you can analyze it. You can make decisions. You can do other things. So that's that's the re, you know the reason for this architecture. And you know I was I was thinking about what we we tend to work with a lot of different uh, 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 types of organizations that use data, and everybody has kind of this recurring set of problems and pain points. And I would say there's five reasons why people have those pain pain points in today's environments for data. What is one is, and I would say the major one, and the one that kind of covers everything is complexity. Data is really complex. Right? Um, we used to have maybe a, a small set of data, a small database we would work with, maybe one system we would work with. Well, well, those days are over, right? We need to bring in data from all over the place. We need to we need to use data produced by other people, not just produced by us. We need to bring in data produced by outside organizations, and we need to bring it all together and make it useful to us. That's complex. That's hard. Nobody's storing the data the way you want to see it, right? They're storing the way they, they want to see it, the way they need to use it. There's a lot of uncertainty in using data. That would be number two, right? Um, what What is the meaning of data? How, you know, what's the right data? Where is it? You know, that kind of thing. Um, data's gotten big, right? Besides being complex, sometimes data can be small and still better, be very complex. Now it's also gotten very big, and that makes it even harder. And you need, you need even computing resources and other things to use it. So that maybe you don't have today. You need fast computers, fast uh, fast access to it. The data also needs to be transformed because nobody stores it the way you want to see it or the way you want to use it. You need to transform it so you get it the way you want to see it. And then finally, uh, the fifth pain point that we see a lot is things aren't reusable. People spend a lot of time creating something and then the next thing they do, they have to kind of start from the ground up, create it again. The next thing they do, they start from the ground up, create it again. And they don't create a, they don't have a, a methodology for creating like a reusable set of components that uh, after they built that, they can use it in a lot of different ways and don't have to rebuild it again. So those are kind of the five five areas that we're trying to solve with this. And so what an architecture like this does is it, it, it allows uh, data to be used we hope by anybody in any situation they're in, you, know, you might be an advanced user, an advanced analyst. You might be somebody who's really uh, uh, can get into the data and understand it yourself. Or you might not be. You might be a, you know, more of a, an executive who says, I need to just point and click and there's my data. So what we're trying to do is solve both of those and everything in between here. We, we, we have a plan to ingest data from any system that might be valuable or necessary. And again, there's a lot of there's a lot of applications listed here. We'll ingest this data in any way we can, right? Some of the data may be done through both refreshes, bulk imports, APIs, change data capture, streaming, any way possible we try to ingest data. And everything lands in this landing zone or what we sometimes call the raw zone, where data just lands there as we're ingesting it. And nobody, it's organized, but it's not transformed. It's not changed in any way. So all the dirty data you're getting from here, that, that would be in here. All the missing data you're getting from here, it would be in here. Because there's value in that, right? Having this raw, untransformed data layer that can be used. That can be used for by people who are really advanced analysts and can make sense of it. Or it can be used by engineers to, to move the data and transform it into other places. The idea here is that we refine it. There's a refine zone here. We we produce better, cleaner data there, what I call almost like master data sometimes that we generate, not that we maintain, but we generate it. I might have location data and I need to create location master data out of it. Or, you know, in a lot of organizations, you you even in state in state governments, federal governments, you might have a client master. So you create a client master table. And and the client master says, might have what, what my actual real name is, even though my name might be in 20 different systems in 20 different ways, right? Or I might have my actual social security when it might have been 
you know, fat fingered in one system or might have my real birthday, even though it's all, it's missing in some systems, you know, so. So we refine data to make it useful for people. Uh, they can always reference it themselves, but they can use it downstream as well. We have the, the analytics zone, which is a lot of what you'll see when you see Power BI and some of the reporting and demos that we'll show. The analytics zone is really intended to be data that's modeled for people who want to do analysis through a, what I call a point and click type uh, type interface. They 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 have certain categories, certain measures. They want to compare those measures to certain categories. They want to trend them over time. They want to compare them last year to this year. Uh, they want to drill down and drill up. They have a region. They want to then look at more detail in that region. That That's something that can be done if it's modeled properly through this point and click type uh, dimensional model that we'll, we'll show later. But that's also not for everybody. Some people might want to do discovery on their own. So there's a discovery zone where people can put data, copy data they need in there, do what they want with it. And it doesn't it doesn't impact or affect anybody else working over here. Ultimately, if the discovery zone produces some value, that data then can that that output can later on be promoted into some of these other areas to be used by other people. And then we also have other other zones that aren't really uh, too relevant for today, but they're kind of more for the future. What, what we would call the real time delivery zone, a way for data to, to be produced through this through this data lake house architecture. For example, I may have a measure that I produce here that's a very complex measure that comes from data in many, many of these systems. Ultimately, as the data flows through here, I have that measure now calculated. That measure can then be delivered in real time output out to applications or APIs or that kind of thing through a mobile app if, if needed. Uh, because that measure has been defined as something that needs to be delivered in real time somewhere else, but it needs it needs access to all these systems to to produce that measure. Um, and then we also have the trusted zone, which is something you'll see a little bit later. A lot of actually what Emmy showed the marketplace originally. That's uh, in in the in the first uh, slide she had up. The marketplace is the way uh, of the future for sharing data. You know, again, we talked about it in April. Uh, let's get away from putting everything in a in a file share in an FTP site. You know, having thousands or millions of files out there. The marketplace is a way for you to find the data you need when you need it. It's a way to subscribe to data you need. It's a way to be notified when data new data is produced that you might need. So you'll see the power of the marketplace as as it gets developed out. And and we in the in the in these use cases we've got a. We've got, I think, some good use cases to show show how to use. So, so we have the marketplace. We have dashboards, uh, Power BI, Tableau, anything else that may want want data in in a dimensional model. We have delivery zone or real time delivery that produce data out to uh, anybody who needs data on demand in real time. And then there's the ad hoc and machine learning models that would be that would be built in the discovery zone. So we're trying to cover all the bases there and trying to remove that level of complexity for the people that that uh, the truth is that complexity gets in the way of, uh, of you doing your job uh, uh, and and trying to trying to make it so that the data is available to you however you need it where you need it and and again not to try to it's, this isn't a one size fits all that tries to fit what everybody needs. Any questions on that? I know I went through it kind of quick, but uh, we spent a lot more time on it, I think, last time. Good. Uh, yes. Uh, one question for the the third stone. Um, how do you keep there picked up the, when you put in the different boxes? This zone here. Yes. This is mostly through. Uh, what we would call pipelines, data pipelines, ET ETL uh, jobs that run that have that pull data from, say, the landing zone, transform it in a way based on the business rules defined and refine it, transform it further and refine it and put it in the analytics zone, for example, right? So it's mostly being done through. In this case, the, these flows would be done through data pipelines, right? ETL jobs behind the scene. And I think, it, I, I think too that you know it's important to remember that this is the 
more of the data architecture, right? So Carl will talk a little bit about the physical architecture because it it's like those zones don't necessarily mean that it's another version of the data or a copy of the data, right? It's yeah. just a way of understanding the state the data is in for your use. So so while we have to talk about them as zones, they're not actually physically separate things. Yeah, that's a good point. Right? That, again, very conceptual here. Is this really a database or, you know, it could be more than one. It could be a lot of, you know, is it a table? It could be, depending on what's needed, it could be. Yes. I was looking at that diagram from last time in spring. So the future can give us these data sources. And it looks like they're the same, but they're different. Like the root, you have three and then you can look at so before they're they want to move. Oh, I don't know that we intended to change it. It should be laws and now future. So the pink is future, the blue is the more known sort of different concept. But this is just an example of data sources. There's a lot. I know she's referencing colors, the projectors washing that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see the color of the but it's just, just think of that as like any data source you can imagine in our enterprise. But when it's with these, you're just kind of showing what which ones are part of the proof of concepts. Okay. And Steve Manta has his hand up. Yeah, thanks, Rochelle. I was just going to kind of reiterate in part what you just said that this is really a, this is a conceptual view, a conceptual flow, not a, technical diagram which i think is kind of important to keep in mind having said that i love this chart you know you know i've said that any number of times um i really like how you called it called out that proof of concept that poc uh data in the data source layer on the left that for me that's really really helpful um it, it's going to help kind of convey to the folks not directly involved in this project what it is we're doing. So that's actually I hadn't seen that before in one of these versions. And I, you may have just you may have just asked it and you kind of broke up. But I, just real quick, what are the color coding? What what is the color coding? So like the, the purple looks like it's future uh, or gray looks yeah, like it's uh, future. It's purple future. And then the blue is what we're working on for the proof of concept. So okay, so what is like the light? the light tan if that's the right color at least it is on my screen uh, are you talking to the data sources steve yeah so look at ingestion right bulk refresh what, why is that why is that colored tan i guess i, I think it's just to offset it from those are really uh, okay. again okay conceptual process okay yeah anyway at, at, at some point at some point, because I do use this chart external to the data management group once in a while, uh, a legend might be helpful. Um, so just a suggestion. But otherwise, I mean, I love this chart. You know that. Thanks. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, good idea. I can see the color. On the old one, there was the three different colors. But it didn't have, it didn't specify what it was, which I think is what Steve was talking about. It's like, what does the blue mean? Did you add a little sure. one there that says what it is? I think we can. Like yeah. future. Yeah. Yeah, I think we can probably simplify it. You know, we, we put a bunch of applications in there because we were trying to like help people make that mental leap, but we. We can add a legend and add some titles and that kind of stuff, so we know they're doing that. Again, the, one of the things I say over and over and over again, and I, Carlos has said it, you know, multiple. We are trying to structure this in such a way that we can meet multiple user needs and multiple use cases. So, uh, so our, we need to do the same thing with our diagrams. <laughs> Um, and so Steve Larry's got a note in here, the concept of authoritativeness. He said he's typed that term a bunch um, in sidebar conversations this morning. And it's something that we need to think about and how NWCG relates to that. Um, 
or what that means for the different zones, how we would manage that. And so I think that that's uh, that's part of this governance process, right? That's why I really emphasize like this meeting itself is part of the governance process and it's part of uh, ongoing conversations that we're going to be having as a community. It's one of the original requirements that was identified in the data cache business requirements is how do we identify authoritative data and states? And so um, definitely a, uh, an important part of the conversation as we continue. So if there are, uh, we can always go back to it. We're here for three days, right? So if anybody has any questions later about this, we can go back to it some more. I think now because uh, in April, we didn't really have what we would call the physical architecture. Uh, we're going to talk about that this time. So, um, so boy, that doesn't look good up here. <laughs> <laughs> the background. Yeah. Um, I may have to look at it down here about that. Yeah. If you can look at it on your machines, it's a little bit better than this. Yeah. Here. You want to use this to look at it? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so we have actually two physical architectures that kind of mirror each other, and it's because we we were targeting. Well, we've been targeting AWS and Azure in different ways. So put together the same. They they uh, they reflect one reflects the other, but this is the one for Azure that we're we're looking at here. Um, so before I get started here, the, what's really important is um, the concept of the cloud, right? So somebody's making noises in the back. <laughs> yeah, but it did improve the visual. It did, it did. Um, so the cloud, just to spend 30 seconds on the cloud, how many people here feel they're comfortable and familiar with the concept of the cloud? Okay, a lot of people here, right? So the idea be behind this physical architecture is really to take advantage of what I consider to be uh, the the main, uh, the two main uh, uh, reasons for being in the cloud, right? Virtualization, uh, and again, everything can be virtualized either as a machine or as a service, which means I can use the a number of resources how I want, when I want it. I can increase resources, I can reduce resources. So it's a big deal uh, when you're building data systems to be able to do that. The other thing is distribution, right? Data distribution. So when I store data, I'm not stuck and storing it on a physical disk drive like I used to be, right? Just like I am, say, on my laptop, I store data on my, on my, on my laptop, but it has a disk, I run out of space, I'm out of space, right? And I used to have servers where the same thing would happen, right? I'd get to a certain point, I'm out of space, well, I'm out of space, I need to increase space or add more storage or, or something. So the idea here is that we're not, in most cases, not even allocating space. As we need it, we just use it, right? And it just grows and grows and grows, and, and, and it grows with us as we grow. Right? And as we need more compute resources through virtualization via the services or other things, we get more resources if we need them, when we need them, right? So, so other than that, it looks a lot like, um, you know, a, a regular physical architecture that you would normally put in a data center. So on the left-hand side, again, over here, we have the various systems or data, data, databases, data sources that we might get data from. These are outside of our uh, uh, outside of our design here. They're mostly they're going to be some kind of source database, Oracle, SQL Server, DB2, something something along those lines. There are going to be files, some kind of external set of files that we might use or need, or they might be software as a service where we have access not necessarily to the data. Uh, database itself, but we might have access to the through APIs to the data. And so we have some, uh, 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 an ETL tool running in the cloud called Matillion. Matillion is installed on a virtual machine. And Matillion is able to, again, we, we can install it and ramp up resources or reduce resources as we need. And Matillion is the, the tool that has connectors to all these systems. So it has connectors to source databases. 
to external file systems to, to systems. So for example, if I want to connect to Microsoft Dynamics, I can. If I want to connect to Salesforce Marketing Cloud, I can. If I want to kind of connect to any social media or other external system, I can. So it has native connectors for all those things. Like I could over 100. I don't even know how much they're up to, probably close to 200 now. And of course, it has connectors to databases and file systems and FTP sites and anything else we might need. And so, but tell me this the tool that will ingest that data into that landing zone and, and drop it there and organize it there so that it's always available, never goes away. And it's it's always available for later use. And again, that landing zone is basically a data lake. That that data lake part of the data lake house is a data again, a place that we can continue to grow with without having to worry about storage itself. And so Matillion, um, let me look at this screen here for Excel, but Matillion in the Azure environment will use blob storage as the data lake environment. And, and in blob storage is where that landing area will, uh, will live in this case. As the data then is transformed because we need to refine it, we need to create refined data or we need to uh, um, produce analytic data, Matillion will do that in Snowflake. And so, um, <clears throat> so Snowflake is a service. And to act as Snowflake, we create a private endpoint and what's called a private link service to be able to make Snowflake be look like it's part of our environment. <clears throat> so, so we make it look like it's in, inside our system, even though it really isn't. And and data then gets sent over to Snowflake and then transformed. And what Matillion does is Matillion doesn't have an engine to transform data. It uses Snowflake to transform it. The reason being, again, the huge concept of the cloud is that we can distribute data and run run on resources that uh, that can run in parallel. Well, instead of Matillion trying to do that, they use a Snowflake to do that, which is really good at running a large scale data movement, data queries, uh, data transformation processes in parallel over a massive reason we're using those tools in this case. As data gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it can use the resources that are, that are part of the system to do that. And so these private endpoints and private link services and, and virtual network gateways are really just ways to access that data and stuff like and, and make it secure and make it be so that it looks like it's never leaving the boundary that you've built for your system, right? So it's the security part of it so that it never goes outside that boundary. In this case, we also have Power BI and Tableau pointing at that private link service and allowing you through your desktop to create dashboards or reports and things like that. Then there's also the Power BI service, which is another service in the cloud that doesn't actually live in Azure. It's still a Microsoft service, but it doesn't live in Azure. That Power BI service needs to run once, once uh, Power BI dashboards and reports are produced. And it can execute by uh, using a virtual network gateway and access also the same data. And finally, we have the data marketplace. And the data marketplace is uh, mostly going to be accessing Snowflake data as well. And then it will be then producing data products out to the outside world or, or, or you know, to whoever your intended target is in this case. And, and those data products using product metadata and and the, and the the techniques used in the data marketplace, that that the metadata of that data will be stored in blob storage as well. And then the data marketplace will produce data to outside subscribers, uh, getting it from stuff like typically itself. So I know this sounds a little bit complicated. A lot of it is really just about how data is going to be accessed in a secure way through what network and through through what virtual network. In this case, we have two virtual networks that um, one for Snowflake and one for Matillion, where Matillion runs. And the reason being is we're trying to mimic what we would have mimicked in the physical world, right? If we would have created a data, in a data center, we would have built a couple of, a few servers and a few machines and networked those together. And, and that this virtual system mimics what we were doing there. But in this case, these services are actually not together and they're not close to each other. You know, they're not physically close to each other. Uh, you know, Power BI service is running its own data center, Snowflake service is running its own data center. And so what we're trying to do is make it all seem like it's uh, right.
the cure rate cost with whether or nothing ever leaves this boundary. Um, in this case, we would have, we would also have more more than one environment. You would probably like to have a DAB task QA and prod environment, uh, as many as you need. That would that would that would look alike here. We would use single uh, SSO. In this case, I think FAMAUTH would be the way to sign in to any of the extra uh, anything that a user would have access to, which is in this case would be typically Power BI Tableau or the data marketplace. But most users, that's how typically they would interface with a system like this. Um, all connections are solely made through private link, which is again a, a way to to highlight to make it again. Uh, if you use private link, uh, you you become FedRAP compliant as the data moves moves through this process, right? Because uh, it's it's an approved process for uh, that it 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 makes the system look like it's the, net, the data is never leaving the data center. And um, and then also uh, you you would also be able to extract data from stuff like in this case through through uh, what they call an internal stage, which is a way to extract and download data yourself. So what this what this architecture provides, this physical architecture provides, is a way for again everybody to have access to the data the way they need it, regardless of how we conceptualize it in the other and the other diagram that we showed. Mostly the other diagram that we showed, most of the zones will actually live here in Snowflake. And and we'll, you know, we're building the analytic zone there, the refined zone there, and even the raw zone will, will likely be in Snowflake. And everything else will be used as a way to connect to that data and and to have have a way for you to use it using the interface you want to use it. So if you have a different tool that you need to use it with, you have an API call you need to make. Uh, uh, you have something you want to publish, there's a way in this physical architecture to, to do that part of the work as well. Anything I missed or any questions about this or anything I should say that I didn't say? Question? Yeah. So, Matrillion on the VM, is that a requirement? And the reason I ask is AWS does not allow VMs. Um, or Azure does. Well, are you doing well, the AWS or is the clients from the Forest Service in their AWS? AWS. AWS. Oh. Yes, they have a really, really, really good reason. So I think well, that's probably good. So what I would say on this is um, because this is like really new for many of our IT programs. <laughs> To, to implement what we're what we're doing is um, we have a little bit of space and uh, before we get our development contract in place, and so we're going to use that time. Brad is helping us work with the Forest Service uh, Skynet team. I have all these nets, FireNet, Skynet, Skynet, the, which is the AWS team and the Forest Service Azure cloud hosting team. And we're actually going to deploy Snowflake in both of those environments and the concept and just kind of see, we want to see like how it works in the government environments and, and kind of walk through some of this because it is a different approach than we've utilized before. And so I think we'll learn a lot about that as we go through And that's part of the decision we talked to the program board about, um, I don't have to talk to the program board yet, we've been talking to another group. <laughs> I can't remember who I'm talking to at the particular point in time, but um, one of the decisions that has to be made for IBME is whether it's going in an AWS environment or an Azure environment, and this will give us an opportunity to weigh some of that and to look at what moving data might look like because we've got data that's in a lot of data that's in AWS and a little bit of data that might be in Azure, so we need to kind of work through some of that. So I think, Brad, if we do these proof of concepts, in these two environments, those are some of the things that I want to look at. But I was just wondering if you looked at a tilling money not on a VM, the chance. Um, well, maybe I would have to ask you the question as to how you're using AWS without VMs. Uh, <laughs> I hear all these people building applications like Patricia's team, but they must be on VMs. Yeah, we've got ours is serverless with like state machines and lambdas and all that kind of stuff. but. Only because we don't want to take on having a patch in this T instance. So it's that's why I'm asking. It's like 
AWS has a virtual machine service. It's easy too. So, but my question is, is the Skynet team architecture board saying you can't use them? That's different. So I think that's the conversation we'll yes. want to think about tomorrow. Um, I think Frey has his hand up. Good question. Yeah. Hey, Carlos. Um, so I have a uh, an evaluation copy of Snowflake, and I've been running a lot of uh, data prep sequences, and, um, and and I and I've got like about fifteen iterations for each one. You know. Uh, I didn't want to like get rid of my my legacy sequences and snippet, but I'm really clogging it up. And I'm wondering, are you making allowances for something along, along those lines where, you know, there's a temporary holding place for these things. And then once, you know, I'm terrible at, you know, cleaning up my uh, my messes sometimes, but uh, I'm just finding that I'm, I'm really clogging up my uh, my service right now. Are you making allowances for some place to have these? Uh, Thanks. Not sure I got all that. Yeah, great. You you were cutting out. Can you um, maybe type that in? Because uh, I I think we missed a couple of critical words. <laughs> Wait, sorry. Uh, I've got a really terrible microphone here. How's this? A little bit better? No. Oh, okay. I I will type it into the chat. Sorry. While you're doing that, um, Kristen asked, well, or have anyone? Okay, Space in the Cloud run Python tasks. Currently, there's not a solution I'm familiar with that isn't tied to one person's personal environment. Um, Snowflake has that. What's the question again? Is there a place to run Python? Yeah, would it be possible to have space on the cloud to schedule Python tasks? Currently, there is not something you're familiar with that isn't tied to one person's personal environment. Um, so there would be a couple of ways in this architecture, right? I mean, we I don't know that I've included a way to actually say, well, let's just have a place to run Python. So Snowflake has a, one of the tools, I guess, within Snowflake. Snowflake is, is Snowpark, which is a version of PySpark. Right, so if you're familiar with uh, PySpark, using Spark or Databricks, right, it's kind of a, a similar environment to that. And so that's mostly most people use Python right, when they when they run Snowpark. That would be running things in Snowflake kind of directly. Um, Matillion allows you to run Python as well, right? So you can write code in Python and execute it using Matillion also. We don't have a a pure like Python engine here that says, okay, let's just again have a service where we can where I can issue Python code and run it. But um but uh we have so I guess we haven't included that specifically. Would that be like a potential for the discovery zone? Because in the it discovery is. zone yeah. they can act as the processing power as well to get the I would say so. Yeah, I would say so. In fact, that's where you would use whatever tool you want, right? So in my mind. So yes, survey. Threw that out there with the discovery zone be a place where we could exchange or call Python scripts for the benefit of multiple yeah, users. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, the discovery zone, I think the thing that's cool about that is it really is, I, I think it has the potential to really bring our research community in, in the fact that the way that Snowflake works is they would be able to access that data, clone the data, and so they wouldn't interfere with what we consider production, right? But they would be able to have real-time data that they can iterate on, they can discover, they have access to some processing capability. Like if a research group wanted to do some work in that environment, they get they, we could also give them the, the, the ticket, the cost ticket, right? So they they can manage that themselves. And, and there's just some capability there that that we start being able to access that we haven't had in the past when everything is very siloed and very difficult. And so I, I think that discovery zone for folks that want to really explore offers multiple dimensions, access to the data and the processing capability 
to do few things they might not have been able to do otherwise, or have done been doing in disconnected environments. By the way, let me go back to what I think what you were asking, because I think in general, ideally here, the um, it's to use services, right? Not not to provision a bunch of VMs or EC2 instances or anything like that. I think in any of these systems, we're better off if we can use services. And uh, any tool like Matillion, when they produce, like sometimes they have two different versions of their product, one that can run on the VM, and maybe one you can use as a cloud service. Anytime we can use the version as a cloud service, we will. Um, and I think that's something Matillion is intending to produce soon, but it isn't out yet. So currently today, when you when you when you do a it's that you know you you provision an instance of material and it actually provisions a VM under the covers even if you don't want one. So and ideally we would use a service because it's much easier than to pay as you go, right? Use resources when you need them and then you don't use them when you don't need them. Versus having a bunch of VMs or EC2 instances you know, hanging around. I had somebody ask me, so Michelle and Snowflake, are they using AI to clean up the data and package it? Or is it going to be people? Um, and if so, so will they have to interact and use Matillion and Snowflake directly? Yeah, it's people. I mean, typically the user of, of Matillion would be a data engineer. That's somebody who would interact with Matillion. Nobody else would typically interact with Matillion. The, the interaction here by users would be through Power BI or Tableau or the marketplace by most users. But but in those cases, you would interact with Snowflake directly. And they would have to deal with data cleanup packaging? No. Uh, no, I mean, no. the idea is that once we refine data, if that's what you're talking about, refinement is probably, you know, it's probably you know, cleaned up and packaging and those kind of things that you're talking about mostly, right? Yeah. And that's delivered to you by Matillion in the refined zone through business rules, through, you know, agreed upon ways of doing things, right? Okay. Now, does that mean you can't further transform it in Power BI or in a marketplace or anything else? You can, right? You can, you know, if there's some, if there's a new measure or a new way of looking at something in Power, Power BI or Tableau, you can do that. In fact, in the other diagram, in the conceptual diagram, we had this virtualization layer underneath it because all these tools essentially have a small virtualization layer. When I'm, when I'm using data in Power BI, I'm using it through a Power BI data set. And in a Power BI data set, I can do other things to the data and transform it even more there. What we try to do is avoid doing the heavy duty transformation there. Because doing it at the time you're going to produce a dashboard is the hardest place to do it and the most difficult. And it's not really the right place to do it. That's where you don't have massively distributed data and you have access to all the data the way you want it, right? Uh, but you can't. You can't. So it allows you to produce new data uh, wherever you want. Really. Those pieces, yeah. Just to clarify something, I think I heard you just mention and taking a look at the diagram. The software as a service or whatever those might, um, the external sources that are coming in, the connector only has to be with Matillion, correct? It's not a direct connection to Snowflake. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The idea here being that everything would go through Matillion in this case. To, to your question, Brad, the other thing, the, the discovery zone, the other thing that it gives us, right, is a place to do some, apply some machine learning and some AI to the data. That doesn't disrupt the, so the, I think that that what all of this does, right, is position our data to be available for AI and machine learning in a way that's more reliable. And so that hopefully as we do things like collect our business rules for our data in Edge, that we can apply those business rules to the data in an automated way through products like Matillion, so that we have we have governed ways that the data is transformed so that Hopefully, we can address biases or uh, you know issues with the quality of the data historically, mm -hmm. so that when we do start applying it or utilizing it in AI models or machine learning models, that we we understand the data well enough to understand the results the machines give us. Okay. 
Yeah, I would say just to cover the AI part of it, going back to the conceptual model here. If, if I'm trying to develop a new machine learning model, a new AI model, what I would likely do is I would fire up my discovery zone, which let's say has nothing in it. I would probably go over here to the landing zone and pull in all the relevant raw data that I think might be useful for what I'm doing. And so I would essentially be able, this doesn't show it here, but be able to copy it from here to here. At that point, I would develop and do my development. And let's say I ultimately come up with uh, a, a machine learning model that I think is valuable and useful. Mm -hmm. Then what I could do is figure out, and, that, and that's one thing, this model, and we haven't covered a use case with that yet, and, and the physical model doesn't actually answer for you because it says, now I want to deploy that, where do I deploy it to and how? Because two different things happen there. I created a model that needs to have data fed into it to produce some kind of prediction or outcome or categorization or label of something. And, and that model needs to be fed data as that happens in a production world to make it work, right? So, so I may have done heavy, heavy, heavy duty transformation to that data here to make that model work. And that data transformation needs to be moved into the system somehow, somewhere. Mm -hmm. And until we, we address the use case, let's say, to do that, we probably don't know exactly how that will happen. This will support it, but will it will 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 there be another zone where something gets moved into? Maybe a maybe a zone that we call the the feature engineering zone or something like that, or that becomes part of the refine zone, possibly like that. But those features that that machine learning model needs to use need to be created, or you know, as in a live system, and and that data needs to be transformed in such a way that mimics what that data scientist maybe did. So. So it's a it's a process that will be supported, but it's not really you know laid out here very specifically. So a good use case would be, and this has been an issue for a long time, is you have Erwin with one incident, then goes into an inform, which then goes to the agency's um, system. They have their own fields, whatever. Well, one fire is going to be in multiple, but you really all want to see the outcome of one incident with all of that information in it. So currently, Karen Short is manually basically going through and doing that. So that would be a good use case of doing that. We we tried to build that into the data warehouse back when, and it was really difficult. We never got it to work. And that uh, would be a good one. And would, that, would the solution there be a Again, a business rules based solution, or is it an AI machine learning based solution? What is the thinking? AI is going to probably work better because of matching and things like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so we have to build in things like we're going to look at the the fire name first, then we're going to look at the right. discovery date first, and then the ownership, and go down all these steps right. before we came out with one. So. Whether you do it through machine learning or you do it through a set of business rules, most of that would likely happen here through discovery. And then that would be deployed somewhere in here in this arrow. It was when the data is being moved from landing to refined is when the machine learning model or those business rules would be employed. And so when we landed the data in the refine zone, we would know what the right incident is. And maybe we would have a percentage, a, a, a confidence level, right? That we would say we're 99% sure this is the, the right incident or the, the right data about an incident. Or however, we might want to frame that. Uh, but if machine learning did it, it would still be deployed into this process here from a in a production sense. It would be developed in here. What would the rest of between like business rules and machine learning on that one? Like I can see like how you could create the business role. Look for this attitude. It's just not just look for the next one, just that is a right. that's not on Malachi. Like no. what that's yeah, typically that would be rules. an expert system, right? Let's say yeah. you get date, you get information from a number of experts who who can give you all the rules 
There might be 200 rules, 300 rules, but you gather all the rules and you put it into the process. I mean, it is, quote unquote, you know, what, what AI is today is kind of a, it's a, there's a lot of hype around it. That actually is AI because I'm mimicking what a person would have done, right? I'm, I'm mimic, mimicking a, a, an intelligent person, right? So if I go back to my classes in AI in 40 years ago in college, right? We would have considered that to be AI, even though there's not really machine learning involved in that. Because I can't tell the difference between a real person and, and the machine. So you got uh, Michelle and Cheryl, do you get person to get with on that too? Oh yeah, yeah, she's I hold this. <laughs> on the other hand, machine learning can help with the nuances sometimes of matching. For example, let's say there's text is being entered in multiple different ways in different places. Am I really talking about the same thing? I can use machine learning to give me a, uh, to, to make the best match, for example, right? Because it can match with all the other records in the system and say, this is the one that would be best, right? If the match is not well known, right? If it's not a, a, a clear screen match that it may want to do. Um, so, Carlos, uh, Kristen's asking, could we use the discovery zone for natural language learning as well as to pass the data sets? Yeah, yeah, natural language would be a great place to do that. That would be perfect for that, too. The, the big advantage, let me kind of make a little comment about this, too, because ChatGPT and all these other things have made, you know, everybody's like uh, talking about that now. So, how can I take advantage of something like ChatGPT? And, but, have it use my data, right? And this is the way you do it right here. So you have all the data you want in your organization right here, and you spin up a, a service in Azure in this case, an open AI service, or the chat GPT model is running, and you combine the chat GPT model with your data securely because it's all inside this boundary right here. And then what you do then is you get to a point where now I can ask questions of my data and it can give me answers, right? Um, uh, and that's the way it knows your data. Now, how does it know about your data? You can you can say try to train it with what's in the landing zone and say I'm gonna I'm gonna have ChatGPT or OpenAI understand or learn everything about everything I've ever stored here it is. And you might get pretty good answers. You might even get some surprising answers, right? But an even better way to have ChatGPT work really well is to have it know your analytic data. Because your analytic data is the way you, you know, the way you would ask the questions is how we, we tried to model the data in the analytic zone. And that's the way ChatGPT would ask them, or, or, or that's the way you would ask them of ChatGPT. For example, I would ask, how many fires were there yesterday? And it would give me the right answer. And I would say, and I would say, well, how does that compare to the day before? And it would give me the right answer because we modeled the analytics zone to be able to produce those answers if you point and click. And so those are the kind of things where you can get a lot of power out of those types of interfaces or somebody even on their phone asking the question and they get the answer. How many fires were there two days ago? You get the answer. And, and, and so that's the... Uh, Again, not shown in this because it's all conceptual, but that would be the way to solve those problems through this through this process. Which I think in the future is an interface a lot of people are going to expect to have. So the business service would add Chef GPT there. Yeah. Yeah, we would actually add yeah, large one. Yeah. Oh yeah, not yet. Yeah. Or open AI. I would call yeah. it open AI, right? I probably put open AI, yes, somewhere in here, right? You know, so it has access through private links and stuff like that. So we just need a use case for it. That's a question. So if um, the data come in from different data source and they use the same concept, but meaning maybe overlap, maybe 20% difference. Yeah. In the, which part of this process you will adjust and then find the right concept for this use of yeah. use case. Most of that's going to happen between here and here, like you're from the landing zone, the raws of what we call the raws going to the refined zone. Right. Those decisions about, you know, that you're really, you know, if we, we say what you're really doing, you're trying to create master data, right? Mm -hmm. You're trying to say, I have an incident and I want to know the, the, 
the actual incident data, even though it's oh, there's a lot of overlap. It's it's a little bit different in different systems. It would it would be in the refined data that we would, we would do that. So the business rules that would need to be applied to make those decisions again would live somewhere in here. In, in between going from raw to refined. And I think for us, you know, we we know that Erwin integrates a lot of that data during operations. We also know from Inform by reporting that there are, there are instances where we have batch uploads from the states. So then there's again a, another comparison of records, right? And we know that we have kept the um, conflict detection criteria pretty light in Erwin deliberately because we want to keep that data moving at a rapid pace, right? It's about making sure that people can do what they need to do operationally. And so there are there are opportunities where we can continue refining and cleaning that data up. But our incident data really is in, is in way better shape than a lot of people's data in lots of ways. Um, but if you, if you take that concept and apply it to resource data, when we talk about ROS data and, you know, or we talk about data that, our focus for IBME is going to be fire environment, right? So we're talking about all of this different fire environment data that has is could come in from multiple sources, and we have a specific need in fire, right? So how do we refine that to meet our fire business need, and how do we refine it to meet an interagency fire business need, right? And so those those two phrases, right, interagency and fire then mean that we're going to be taking data from different places and, and refining it for our specific needs. And so that's part of what this architecture, what we wanted to ensure we had those capabilities, right? Because we expect new data sources to come. We have all kinds of requirements to work with NASA and NOAA, and you know, they've got all kinds of money to help us, and, and academia has money to help us, right? And as they develop better, develop different tools, develop different data sets. Like we have to know how to be, we have to have a mechanism to be able to bring those in. Imagery is a big issue, right? Uh, um, sensor data is a big issue for us as we start getting into resource tracking at, a, at scale naturally. Um, we've got our Cal Fire partners here have been doing it for a while, right? So we can learn from them. But all of those types of things are what we wanted to make sure we had an architecture that it could handle that even if it wasn't part of our initial use cases or the concept. Yeah, and I think a lot of these other, you know, process, like I said, because this is conceptual, it doesn't show in detail in the physical architecture, obviously doesn't show any of the solutions, really, it just shows the components. But, you know, for example, in a lot of, uh, uh, you, you know, in state governments, for example, it's a, uh, People who receive a lot of services, it's important to know, is this, am I giving services to one person or two? You know, it's hard to tell. So, so in those cases, right, we try to put a lot of these matching type processes and say, I'm gonna, I have to create one, one master record for a person so that they might be getting Medicaid and they might be, uh, you know, getting other child care services and maybe they're getting Obamacare are they the same person? Because sometimes they can't get they can't get multiple services if they are the same person. So it's important to do that in other areas, and a lot of that is done through these rules, right? Rules based processes to do it. On the other hand, sometimes you get data from the outside that you don't control from another service, and you say, is for example, in a case in a real case that we worked on a few years ago, we wanted to know was was uh, uh, the ADA or Obamacare, right? For people who were formerly on Medicaid, were they going over to Obamacare? Well, those two systems didn't share that, you know, that data back and forth. So Medicaid gave us a set of people and said, see if they're in your system. And if they are, we know they went over to, if, they, if they're in this other database, they went over to, to Obamacare. And the only way to do that well was to do it through some machine learning matching, right? In that case, we didn't know the, what the rules were, right? We didn't know the business rules. So what we were able to do is say, let's let's put together uh, something that uh, gives us a visual or like a, a way to look at this person and have machine learning look at it and say, is it likely to be any of these other people who are already in the bottom care? And it would give us a, a, 
uh, uh, again, a confidence level. And I would say, well, there's one person, the, the person you're most likely to be is this one, and I only have a confidence level of 38%. Well, we would like to say that's probably not the right person. But if it said, this is, this is the person you're most likely to be, and it's 92%, we would say, well, that's probably you, right? So there's all these techniques that aren't really outlined here. We're doing it, but again, the architecture supports it. As you need it, you, you ramp up services and other processes to do it. In that case, we use Python, right? So you ramp up Python and you say, okay, I need Python and I'm gonna put this custom process in place to make sure we can do it. So so while it doesn't call it out, it's all available, it would be available. So okay, we're gonna have to side burn this one too, but yeah, we would definitely need data engineers, data engineers specifically for this almost working full time and we've that's talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay, what's next, Carl? I don't think I have anything else unless if somebody else has any other questions. I think I'm gonna we're gonna do some more demos and I'll move it over and uh, give it over to Mike. Oh yeah. <clears throat> See if I can figure out the screen sharing. We're using VGA here, Tom. Is that what you're saying? HDMI. And the teams defeat our data engine. <laughs> I wasn't able to share a couple minutes ago with Emmy, help me out. You see on the share button now? Yeah. Yeah, that's the deal breaker there. Yeah. Okay. So I'll kind of walk through the process. Connection lost. Uh, walk through kind of the whole process that Carlos was talking about from data ingestion all the way to the marketplace. So if I get control of my screen. Logged in quickly. You need a charger, or you're good. This should be good. Really close to lunch. Carlos is the talker between the two of us, so I'll be a little bit more free. <laughs> uh, let's. We'll start with data ingestion. We talked about. Uh, use cases one and two a little bit in Texas, so I'll focus on use case three for ingestion, and then we'll kind of talk through all of them. But uh, for use case three, we're pulling in informed data from the NIFSI org, which is on the back end is the ArcGIS API. So what we're doing is Matillion has these native API connectors. Uh, if we look under components, we have all these built-in connectors. We have you know, all these SQL databases, kind of like Carlos was saying. We have Excel, we have Facebook, Gmail, kind of everything you can think of, but it doesn't have ArcGIS. So it has this built-in capability where we can build a custom API connector. And so we built a custom connector that gets us in behind the NIST order to get the private informed data site or data set. And so one of the limitations we had with the ArcGIS API is that we can only pull 2,000 rows of data at a time. And so we had to build a little bit of a process around that in order to pull all the incident data. There's approximately 600,000 incidents uh, that the informed data set contains. And so we did a little bit of uh, data engineering, I guess, in this process to be able to pull all of those records and to also be able to keep up with inform, which is refreshing every five minutes. Uh, just to kind of quickly walk through what is happening in this process that allows us to keep up with inform and pull more than 2000 rows. So the first step we're doing, and this is all in Matillion, um, is we're getting the most recent date. So 
What was the most recent data that we pulled the last time we executed this process? So we have our starting point. Right? And that allows us to write a query to our GIS through this Matillion API and pull all of the data that's new and change. We don't want to be running or we don't want to be iterating over 600,000 rooms of data in chunks of 2,000 every five minutes. So we want to only pull the newest, uh, new and changed data. So we're pulling our, our most recent modified date time from that informed data set. And then what we're doing is some conversion. Uh, and setting some variables and things like that. And we're also uh, using Python to generate our token and get our credentials from uh, ArcGIS or so connecting securely. And then this API extract component here, uh, this is kind of doing the heavy lifting for us. So the first step is now we know when, when our most recent date was. Well, how many rows do we need to pull? How many rows have changed since our last load? So we're using that most recent date, and then um, ArcGIS has this uh, component in their API where it only returns a row count. So this is saying, okay, we have this many rows of data since the last change date, so now we know how many iterations to do. So once we know how many iterations to do, if there's only been 1,500 rows returned, or there's only 1,500 new and changed rows of data, we're only going to do one iteration. So now we know how many iterations to do. Sort of set some internal variables and parameters that control the number of iterations. Uh, and then we iterate. So this is us iterating over calling the API for each chunk of 2000 rows. So here's another custom API component that was developed. Um, and so we have a couple query parameters. So we have our tokens or credentials to authenticate to get in and actually pull the data. We have our where clause, so we're pulling data only where the data, the modified data is okay. greater than or equal to that last uh, most recent record we have in our system. And then we also have this result offset. And this allows us to pull data in chunks of 2000 rows at a time. So if we have 4,000 or 4,500 rows uh, that have changed or are new since our last run, we're going to use this result offset to tell it, hey, this is our first iteration. We have pulled the first 2,000 records. We don't want to pull those again. So we want to pull the next 2,000. So the result offset in that scenario would be 2,000. And so it would give us the next 2,000 rows. And if we had another iteration, it would change to 4,000. So we're always pulling the data that we want, we're not duplicating it. And then once we get the data into Snowflake, so the final landing spot with this is in Snowflake and in, in this component we set up where we want it to go. Uh, we're dropping it in our landing zone or the raw zone in Snowflake and in this informed private table. And then after that, we're going to do some more refinement, um, but I can show you what that looks like from our GIS API. So this is Snowflake, if you guys are familiar with it. And we look at the table, it's going to be the raw data from the API in JSON format. So if I preview this. It'd be difficult to see. I don't know if I can get it any bigger. Perfect. So this is the data we're getting. This is the informed data set uh, from the NIFC org. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this data set looks like, but this is the format we're getting in. It's JSON format, it's unstructured. There's some nesting in different levels in here that we need to parse out to be able to use this data in a dashboard and reporting in the marketplace and further on in all of these different zones that we talked about earlier. So that's the main, I guess, ingestion part of the process. It's very... It's all 
told them. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question, Michael. Yeah. So that iteration of the records and all that, if you're going to take it, take data from the NIPSI org for the time, which yeah. I imagine we will, you don't have to do that again. You can reuse that piece. Yeah, we would essentially just copy that same process and use it wherever we needed to. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important concept, right? Yeah, yeah. That that these become reusable, and so you can use the same methodology again and again, right? So it's reliable, and then you know people don't have to go individually develop that for themselves. That we start building a catalog of this, right? So then you can go see, oh, I need these these reusable parts and pieces. So that I have to, I don't have to do as much work. I can put my energy and focus it into the to the twenty percent work rather than the eighty percent work. So they say data engineers eighty percent of the time is finding, cleaning, and munging data. Right. Well, we want to try and do as much of that as possible here, so that that twenty percent grows. That can that that time is spent on that analytic end, doing getting actually interrogating the data, understanding, getting new insight, right? And that's, so as much as possible, we wanna make this easier for the data scientists, for analysts, for developers, right? We're always thinking about reusable components that, so we can reduce work. Yeah, and another good example of that is, uh, this is, the API extract we're using to get data out of edge. I think in our in, over the course of the three POCs, we I think we extracted about 10 different data sets. Some are from edge, some are from different sources, and I'll kind of walk through that in a little bit. But this is it. This is the only job that's extracting all of them. Um, we have this one API extract. It's fully parameterized. Our credentials are parameterized. The endpoint that we're hitting is parameterized. The queries are parameterized. All of that's stored in the Snowflake, except the credentials, which are uh, acquired on the fly. And we're essentially just iterating through all the queries against the different endpoints. And so if we needed to add another endpoint, we would do a little bit of config on Matillion, insert one row of data into Snowflake, and it would work. And so if I open this up, if we look here, this data source is parameterized. And what that's iterating over is a table in Snowflake with each of the endpoints that we configure in Atelier. Those endpoints um, look like this. So if we, for example, we have all of our different fuel model types. These are hitting different endpoints in Edge and they're writing different queries, but we can parameterize all of that. So we need one job and it just loops through everything if we need it to. So we have our incident position codes and titles are and WCG organization, and then all of these other edge data sources. And so that reusability really comes into play here, where it's a little bit of config, and then insert one row of data into Snowflake, and it runs. Are there any questions on this part? There's a question online from Melissa yeah, but but care. Okay, so I guess the next step is now we have this data, we need to refine it and enhance it and uh, make it more usable and make it work in all of these different zones. There's a lot of talk for a third use case about time and incident time and local time of incidents uh, compared to what we have in the informed data set, which is epoch time. And epoch time, if you're not familiar, is milliseconds since January 1st, 1970. And so, that's how I always ask the time of the So, that doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people. It might mean something to Carlos and I or some of the power users, but what is a regular business user going to do with a date time that's like 1.6 billion? And how, do, how is that interpreted? How can you determine? in regular Power BI or in Excel that what was the local time of this incident? What was the local discovery time, for example? 
And it takes a lot of work to figure out how do I convert that into a usable date time? I, I would just add the other thing that we all know and have experienced and Travis can, can speak to it because he was experiencing that pain specifically is that then you get things like this where the server is at that your computer is pointing to, what time zone your particular laptop is pointed to, what, you know, there's like all of these things. And Travis was going through this use case where he was trying to get informed data and do some different things with it. And through these conversions that he was having to go through, he, sometimes he was like, there were, there were five hours difference in times that he was getting from different sources. And so what we're trying to really solve for is to have a consistent, reliable way for somebody to say, what was the local time at the point of origin for this incident? That's the, that's the question we're trying to be able to answer consistently and reliably. So. Yes, there's a lot of talk on time. And, and so I'll kind of talk through how we went about solving the issue. Uh, so. U.S. Department of Transportation is the agency in charge of time zones. So they're responsible for maintaining the time zone boundaries and everything that's involved with the time zones. They have their own open data site and they have, it's also an ArcGIS open data site and they have polygons uh, of each time zone in the U.S. Since we have uh, points we have lat long for the initial discovery location of incidents. What we decided to do was use USDOT polygons and the incident locations to try to determine okay what was the actual time of the incident uh, at the time I guess the local time of the incident the local incident time. And so I can walk through a little bit of that. So Actually, we're using the same job right here to pull in the data from the USDOT open data site. So this is handling that for us. And essentially, it's 13 rows of data with giant polygons that encompass each time zone in the US. The first thing we needed to do, uh, hold up. So, like the first thing we needed to do was, well, they have 13 rows of data. There's 13 time zones, or maybe. It's not the right number. Maybe there's eight. Um, those time zones have different times during different parts of the year. So then we needed to expand the, that time zone data set in order to account, uh, accommodate daylight savings time. Um, and so we expanded that data set essentially by duplicating everything and having two rows for each time zone with an effective uh, date and time. Let's see if I can. That table up. So, this is the raw data again. It might not don't make a lot of sense, but it's really just in the same format we're getting the informed data set from the NIFC open data site. This is uh, the same JSON format. So, we essentially have this big coordinate. Uh, or big polygon, and then a couple other attributes. Most importantly, the UTC offset. So we do some further refining in Matillion, and then in our refined zone, find it. We have this time zone polygon test. So there's eight rows here, and so we have our our time zone ID, our name, our UTC offset, and then our polygon. And then some further refinement where we're breaking it up by daylight saving time. And then we also have to expand that to daylight savings time for each year because it's different each year. And I can't remember the rules off the top of my head. It's like the second Sunday in November and the, maybe the first Sunday in March where the two of those dates change. So uh, we have some tables in here that can help us figure out what is the second Sunday in March or what was it in 2002, for example, to make it apply across the board? Question. Yeah. Can you also include like Arizona that doesn't do daylight savings? So the US DOT time zone data set did not include Arizona. So when we're doing this processing, Arizona is a little bit separate. And if the state of the incident 
in the informed data set is Arizona. We just kind of slam in what their UTC offset is. Okay. So after some further refining, find it here, kind of in our reference data. So we have 488 rows. And what this looks like is, so for the Alaska time zone, we'd have our start and end effective dates. So we're able to not only say this point is in this polygon, but the date of this incident was between these two dates. So we know what the exact UTC offset was. Uh, because if there was an incident, say on the second Sunday of March or second Sunday of March or November, we could be off. So we need to make sure that these dates and times that are effective for the specific time zone are correct. So the next part is how do we join <laughs> our in this data, right? We have our polygon here, we have our UTC offset, and our start and end effective dates. So what we do is Snowflake has a little bit of built-in geospatial functionality and we're using this function that they have called ST within. And what that does is it returns true if a point is within a polygon and it returns false if it's not. And so Snowflake is joining each incident to this data set and it's joining is the point within the polygon and also are the is the discovery date between those two starting effective dates. So if there was a fire on the second Sunday of November during daylight savings time, we can still get the correct UTC offset based off of what time that discovery or the incident was discovered on. And so this allows us to handle this on all dates. So what we're doing here is so we have our uh, incident data, we have our time zone data, we join them together, and then that still doesn't answer the question, how do we handle or how do we find local time and how do we find local time for each date that is part of that data set? So I visualize data kind of out in the air, so don't mind me if I'm going like this a little bit. <laughs> so we have our time zone data and we have our incident data, so we need to join them together by is the location in that time zone polygon and are the dates between the effective date range for that UTC offset. So we join those together. So we're kind of in our staging zone. We're in between zones. We're staging and getting ready to load our analytic data so we can report on different time zones. We can report on local time. We can report on UTC for each of these incidents. So we stage it and essentially all we're doing is attaching this UTC offset to each incident record. So we have our staging incidents table, and this has all of our incidents from our last load. And the last column on here is our UTC offset. In my way. So for example, this first incident, we know that the UTC offset is, what is that, 18 million milliseconds. So this, incident was in a time zone where we're actually 18,000 or 18 million milliseconds behind UTC. And so we have that information and now how do we use it? So in our analytics zone, which is our dimensional 90 second overview is a way of organizing data that supports fast and easily executable analytical queries. And it's also structured in a way that Power BI and Tableau are expecting. They're designed to use data modeled and structured in this way. And so by organizing it that way, we can run these large scale aggregations quickly. And we can also point and click and make dashboards in 10 minutes versus you know, transforming data and cleansing it and spending a week to put the dashboard. So a dimensional model has two primary table types we have dimensions and facts. So facts are facts are where your measures are stored. So it's uh, if we look at dim incident or not dim incident, fact incident. Uh, pointers to all of our dimensions and dimensions are anything you want to 
aggregate by or show data by. I think by is the key word. Really, any categorical variable organized in a specific way, when you aggregate it on these different levels, you get the right answer and you get the same answer every time. So we have our fact incident. Uh, these are all pointers to dimensions. A lot of these are different dates than where I'm headed, but some of them don't have dates populated. That's why they're empty. We have our uh, dim incident. We have our dim incident location, dim incident cause. Other ways we can look at these this incident data. And so when we're loading this, we have all of these different pointers to different dates and times. So we have. For example, this is dim time fire ignition key UTC. That might not mean a lot, but when you're doing analytics, you're analyzing this data, you're building a dashboard. If I want to look at the fire ignition time, for instance, in UTC, I use this column. If I want to look at it in local time zone, I use this column. So when building this table, um, we used the data from inform and the time zone data to we join them together and we use a technique in dimensional modeling calling called a role playing dimension. So the time dimension is playing the role of all of these different times. So for example, if we join this table to the time dimension on dim fire ignition key UTC, we can do analysis on what time the ignition was at in UTC. We join it on dim fire ignition key LTZ, which is local time zone. We can do analysis on ignition time in local time zone. And that applies to each and every date and time that we get in this data set. And so, see if I have a good. So if you had a visualization, that would just open up the user to more options. Yes, exactly. And so what it looks like here, so our dim, our time dimension is all it is is a table with every minute of the day. And it has a couple of. Breaking out that time hierarchy, whether it's the morning, whether it's in the afternoon, whether it's at night, uh, what hour it's in. We think of dim time as one row for every minute of the day with some other time feature built into it. I can show what it looks like. We have our dim time key, which is a surrogate key, so it's it doesn't have any meaning or any relation to the data. It's really just an ID. Uh, we have what the time was, what the hour was, in 24 hour time, 12 hour time, uh, the minute, whether it's a.m., p.m., and then we have this time group, which I'll show on a dashboard. A bit. So all we're doing is pointing to different rows in this time dimension from that fact table. So if we're doing some analysis and we want to you know, compare or look at what local discovery time is. So here's our local discovery time or fire discovery time in local and in UTC. And we can see they're different, right? So this incident, it was whatever 327 is in the time dimension. Maybe that's that might be 327 AM. And this one is uh, 147. Uh, yes, PM. And so we can see that there's a difference in using this time dimension processing, and it opens up a whole new way to do some analysis on the time of fire discovery. So, kind of like Emmy mentioned earlier, maybe we all thought that fire started in the afternoon, but after looking at data using this time dimension uh, feature, Maybe it's actually noon versus 3 p.m. or maybe it's 5 p.m. versus 2 p.m. We need to make sure we have resources staffed during those times of days when fires are actually being discovered versus when we think they're being discovered. Are there any questions on this? Jill? Uh, Dim is date in dimensions. Dimensional. Dimension. Dimension. Yeah. No, it's just no. form for dimension. Oh, yeah. just because I'm seeing Yeah. Yeah, so this is. Yeah, it's not enough. Yeah, it's not enough. It's a prefix, yeah. They had a yeah. fact. 
Uh, before you move on, so so Marlo was asking back with, with the Matillion processors, what is the end format of the data process? I, I believe it's a table within Snowflake. Correct. So, yeah, it's different tables in different zones, which is a different way of organizing the data in Snowflake. So we have all of our zones built in Snowflake. So we have our analytic zone, I called it AG. Um, we have our ETL zone. This is where the control data for that um, API process lives. So we have our API control, uh, and it has the, the eight different data sources we're looping over. Uh, we have our MDM, or so our reference data zone, which uh, when we go live, it might be something that's combined with the refine zone. We have our raw zone or our landing zone, which has raw data from every source that we're pulling. Uh, we have our stage zone, which is more a working area for the engineering process to set data aside so we can shore up all of the processing. Yes, you may have already answered this, but so for historical fires where the um, time zone change was on different days than what it is now, did you take that into account? So historical fire, where the, would that mean? Because, uh, because it, when the daylight yeah. thing it has to change when it went into effect. Yeah. And it's saying Arizona didn't, up until 1968, did observe daylight saving. Right. And so, so we, have, we can't just ignore it. So that should all be, uh, whether it is now. <laughs> No, it's, you might yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's all over there. Um, so it's, so that since we have the epoch data, it's down to the millisecond. So we have our cut over right to the millisecond. And if it is on the exact millisecond in that rear edge case, it will default to the next, or the next daylight savings window. So if it joins the two, it'll join to the most current to current time, if that makes sense. So if it was in 2002 and it was on that second November, mm -hmm. second Sunday of November, it would join the daylight savings period of November to March. But if it was from 1968, it wouldn't, there was no epoch term. Right. <laughs> so we'd be, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just epoch, right? It's just negative epoch? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> number of milliseconds from before, right? I don't know if we have 1968 data. Like, <laughs> we have some really. I don't think we have some 1968 in there yet. Um, um, so, so, uh, Michael. PJ's got his hand up. I see that. Um, so, Jennifer says, I bow to the feet of the developer to become this task. And BJ's got his hand up. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think this is huge. This is this is very impressive. Um, I think the fact that we're able to, lack of a better term, epoch forward or backward, um, is is good. I think where potentially some of the analytical questions are going to come from is, in the case of when a time zone changed, there's the human factor that we have to deal with all these fires, right? and is the factor potentially related to the cause tied to kids getting out of school prior to 1968 or after 1968 you know that could be a, a couple hour swing or something like that so um but that's not something for the developers to think about it's more of the people doing the analytics on what the importance of the temporal nature of the uh event is compared to the potential um, cause of the event. Now, if you take it against weather, um, conceivably, then it's really just solar input and time of day that that potentially might affect some of the things. Um, so it's it's really going to be important that the folks doing the analysis and analytics are clearly aware of what these tools now can do for us as as they move forward. I guess just my two cents. <clears throat> no, I think you're what you're pointing to, PJ. I think is that we're that it, essentially we're creating access to data that we didn't have access to before, or at least not easily, right? 
And and so we get to start learning new ways. And I think that's you know really incumbent upon us from a data management perspective to make sure that we're documenting all of this well. So when the analysts go in and use this data, they actually know what it means so that they can make good decisions about it because it's something that is going to be really new and um, unexpected in some ways. Yeah. Well, to LTZ was local time zone. Yes. Okay. And the second one is, and I'm sure people have asked about Arizona, but specifically about the different tribal areas. How do how do you deal with a load of time? Because each one interprets time differently. That is not a scenario that we developed during this each case. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, this is a proof of concept. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a question on one of the LTZs. Yeah. 1290. Uh, 1290, I'm guessing that's a pointer to in time. So was it? Doesn't that take that? Table of actual, yeah. So, would it have one of these? Yes, not in that list, but it was. Yeah, so that points to dim time. So, if we look at 1290. It's a foreign key. Yeah, it's a foreign okay. key. It's pointing to a specific time in this table. So like 97 points to 137 a.m. Oh. Yeah. We all knew time was complex, but. <laughs> what is time, really? Yeah, so when we load that, when we load that time dimension, it might help to look at the sequel. I know not everybody's a good person, but it. So what we're doing is we are joining the inform incident data to that time dimension over and over and over and over again for each of the different times for UTC and for uh, local. So this is fire growth cessation time. Uh, I guess that's for the date and then we're joining for UTC. And then when we join for local time zone, we subtract the offset from the epoch time we have with the data set. And so then our ignition date time, we're doing the same thing, containment, et cetera, et cetera. So we're joining to dim time over and over and over again. And these, with the fact table is storing as pointers to the specific time in that table. So over and over and over again, uh, we're doing this. And so that's kind of that role playing dimension that I talked about a little bit. So the time dimension is playing the role of final strategy attained date time in UTC and in local time zone. It's just a different join to that table to get the specific time that you're looking for. Okay. I think one of the things I would add about a good time dimension that sometimes you get at the you get for free in a way a big advantage out of it is um it's kind of like we do with dates for example i i may uh say give me all the data for uh the second quarter uh, of last year or the fiscal quarter and i actually don't know what the dates are right i i'm kind of fuzzy i know they're kind of maybe maybe it goes from october to december or something like that but i don't have to know if the time dimension the date dimension is laid out well I get the advantage of those groupings, right, that work for me. And the time dimension does the same thing. You can create groupings for different scenarios or different people the way they want to see it reported. So you say, this group likes to see everything reported in four hour time frames. You can create those groupings here and say 12 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 12, and so on. And then you just pick the group and it works. Or you can do five minute increments, or you can do 20 minute increments, you know, depending on how you want to do it. Once you bake that into the time dimension, then it just works and all the all the data lines up and you can drill down, drill up and 
and deliver those different groupings to different, you know, different agencies if you need to do that. And I think that's a hugely powerful thing to, to be able to do because nobody really wants to see it mostly by, you know, every minute or every second, but they do want to see it group, grouped and categorized in some way. Another application for shoes that I like for resource ordering, I rock the Say how many resources you could be setting up between noon and four or something like that, but you can use the work that's done here and reuse it, which is nice. Which I think we'll talk about later, like how to use it, how to get this, because it's still like I still don't understand, like how would I use it, you know, for my whatever the purpose was in an application. So I think talking about how how to get it out there. Yeah. Yeah. So we're I'm coming up on time to break for lunch, so so this is a ton, right? Like there's, some, they're going to throw a lot of detail. So let's go to lunch and I just let your brain reset a little bit. When we come back, we'll start. We'll, we'll look at some of the um, Power BI dashboards and how this kind of gets applied in that view, and then we can talk through some of the stuff that I was alluding to that like. How would you really use this? What would it look like? How could it support your application? And I'd like to just hear some of those ideas, right? Or those questions. Bill? Uh, just a notification. Craig Thompson had something in the chat. That, that, oh, yes. Yeah. Type of question for Carlos. Oh. Yeah. We'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. So, on that happy note of time, <laughs> <laughs> let's break for lunch. And what do we have for lunch? Uh, hour 15. Okay, hour 15. 13. So, we'll come back and get started again. Thanks, Mike. I think wasn't sure if it was nice to be What? Uh, right. And you can a car. Yeah. 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 Yeah.